Uh, my name is Chalmers Johnson. I'm uh, 76 years old, a retired professor from the University of California, where I taught for well over 30 years at uh, both Berkeley and San Diego, primarily in East Asian politics, in the politics of China, Japan, uh, the two Koreas. Uh, one of the things that did happen in my life that certainly influenced my uh, uh, recent work, between uh, 1967 and 1973, I was invited by the then Director of Central Intelligence, Richard Helms, to become a consultant to the Office of National Estimates of the CIA. These were people brought in from the outside to look over the process of writing the most important intelligence reports that the CIA produced in order to check on myopia, bureaucratism, generalized incompetence. Uh, it was uh, interesting, but it also contributed to my view that uh, the United States did not have an intelligence service, that uh, in fact the CIA was the, uh, uh, the private army of the president being used for highly dubious, virtually invariably uh, disastrous interventions in other people's countries, starting with the overthrow of the Iranian government in 1953 for the sake of the British Petroleum Company. We uh, declared that the Prime Minister, elected Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, was a communist. Uh, the Pope would have been a better candidate. Uh, it, that is to say, that he was simply trying to regain some control over uh, uh, Iranian uh, oil uh, assets, uh, and the British uh, wanted him uh, out and uh, talked Eisenhower into doing the dirty work. Uh, this, uh, as I say, has come back in late in life to uh, uh, influenced me. Uh, many people have commented that, well, look, you were a cold warrior. And it's quite true. I did believe that the Soviet Union was a menace. I still think so. Uh, the, uh, but then, therefore, people ask, well, what caused you to change your mind? I mean, you had worked hard on these issues for a long time. It reminds me of a famous crack that the uh, great English economist John Maynard Keynes once made when somebody accused him of being inconsistent he said, uh, when I get new information, I change my position. What, sir, do you do with new information? Uh, the new information that I started getting was, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union in, uh, in 1991. And that is the, the entire raison d'etre of the American imperial position in the, in, on Earth had ended overnight uh, in an unforeseen manner, again, evidence that the CIA was more or less worthless that it couldn't detect uh, that the Soviet Union's economy was coming apart. Uh, the, uh, but the, what struck me was how instantaneously the American government moved to find a replacement enemy. Uh, China, terrorism, drug lords, anything, even instability, anything to keep the military-industrial complex functioning and working. One other thing that led me to rethink my position quite seriously I'm a Japan specialist. I've spent all of my life working in Japan. But like most Japanese and most specialists on Japan, I had never been in Okinawa, the southernmost province of Japan, the poorest province in the country, a Japanese equivalent of Puerto Rico, an island that was acquired by the Japanese Empire late in the 19th century, was always discriminated against, still is to this day, a place with 37 American military bases on it and the last battle of World War II, the bloody battle of Okinawa. The, uh, in 1995, a very serious incident occurred. Two Marines and a sailor uh, from our bases in Okinawa abducted, beat, and raped a 12-year-old girl. This uh, led to the most serious anti-American demonstrations since the Japanese-American Security Treaty had been signed. I got interested. The governor of Okinawa, uh, a man who I admire a good deal, Masahide Ota, had invited me to come and visit and I accepted and for the first time I decided I'd better go see this part of Japan that I'd generally not been to anyway, just in the same way most specialists on America have never been in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was, to say the least, shocked to see what uh, uh, an array of uh, American military bases added up to and they'd been there for 60 years. Uh, sexually violent crimes occurring at the rate of uh, two per month leading to court-martial uh, committed by American troops. One thing after another. The, uh, I began to look into this. Uh, my first reaction was that 
Okinawa is just off the beaten track. The press never gets down here. They don't see it. This is, uh, this is like the uh, Soviet troops in, uh, in uh, East Germany, uh, and they're remaining there even after the wall came down. Uh, but over time, as I began to study Okinawa and then to study the array of uh, the, the most current number, 737 American military bases in other people's countries, that's the official Pentagon count, um, that I began to realize, no, Okinawa was not exceptional. It was unfortunately typical of the, the kinds of problems that are imposed on uh, people who have to live, say, in the case of the Okinawans, a million three hundred thousand people in an extremely small island living cheek by jowl with uh, 17,000 Marines of the 3rd Marine Division uh, is a, uh, something no American understands. There are no foreign troops in this country. That led me to start rethinking my own position on the Cold War. Uh, I began to see it more as a, uh, uh, that it had been a cover for imperialism all along, for our stepping into the shoes of uh, British imperialism after World War II when uh, in 1946, they told President Truman that they could no longer maintain their position in Greece uh, and that we began to uh, assume that role uh, in a uh, uh, sort of seamless transfer of power among English-speaking imperialists. Um, the, uh, and this led to my first book written before 9-11. Uh, 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 it was published in 2000 called Blowback, The Costs and Consequences of American Empire. Blowback is a uh, special art term invented by the CIA, used in the after-action report on the, uh, the uh, overthrow of the Iranian government in 1953, which has just recently been leaked and, uh, uh, and so we have the full text, in which the perpetrators of this incident say, we're going to get some blowback from this. The important thing about the concept, it doesn't just mean retaliation for things our government has done repeatedly over and over again around the world in other people's countries. It means retaliation for things our government has done that have been kept totally secret from the American public. So that when the, when the retaliation comes, they're unable to put it in context. Uh, they don't see cause and effect, just as in the uh, probably the most spectacular example of blowback we know, uh, namely uh, the Al-Qaeda attacks of uh, September 11, uh, 2001. Following on this book, I hadn't intended to write three books. It was an inadvertent trilogy, but on, following on this, I then began to do a study of the American empire and what it actually means. Uh, it's an empire of military bases. In that sense, it's not like the British or French empires of colonies. It is much more like the Soviet empire of uh, satellite nations. Uh, created in Eastern Europe after World War II with uh, uh, puppet governments integrated into uh, the American economic system uh, and with military forces maintaining the balance of power. Uh, we, uh, as I say, have a, it's a huge, expensive uh, apparat on every uh, continent in, on, on the planet other than Antarctica. Uh, it, uh, uh, it does not have anything to do with American national defense. It has everything to do with the maintenance of American hegemony over the, uh, the entire planet. This led to a book called The Sorrows of Empire, Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic that was published in uh, 2004. It was completed just as we launched our invasion of Iraq in 2003. This then led to a further book that I didn't have in mind when I wrote the other two called Nemesis. Nemesis is the ancient Greek goddess of revenge, the punisher of a peculiarly Grecian uh, sin, hubris. Hubris caused by arrogance and, uh, uh, and uh, indifference to other people's needs, something that I concluded was very much associated not always with America in the post-war period, but particularly it was associated with America after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 when we began to say we had won the Cold War. We didn't win it, both sides lost it, it's just they lost it first because they were always poorer. The Air Force started to speak of full spectrum dominance. We began to think of ourselves as a new Rome, uh, capable of dominating the world through uh, military force. Um, it was these 
sorts of things that led to the book that I've called Nemesis uh, and the subtitle The Last Days of the American Republic. Uh, it concerns the huge range of issues that have been imposed upon the American Republic by our imperialism and of course the inescapable accompaniment of imperialism, namely militarism. Uh, something that both concepts are largely or have been in the American political discourse largely taboo. They are now ever so slowly beginning to be recognized in the United States as genuine issues. They have been recognized for a long time by the people on the receiving end around the rest of the world. That uh, blowback may have been secret from the American public, it's never secret from the people uh, on the receiving end. But in a nutshell, that's how I uh, got where I am. Uh, I didn't anticipate that um, all three books would turn out to be bestsellers. Uh, the first book was uh, barely noticed when it was first published. It became a bestseller only after 9-11. Uh, as my publisher said to me, uh, it's a, a hell of a way to, uh, to sell books, but it's better to sell them than not sell them. Uh, and that's uh, essentially the way that uh, came along. I think I've now had my say. My purpose in all of this is to mobilize inattentive Americans to what they're about to lose, namely the uh, freedoms associated with uh, the American Republic, and to understand that once they lose it, they'll never get it back. The, the, the classic example of this was the Roman Republic, on which the American Republic was in very large uh, degree modeled uh, and the loss of the Roman Republic after the uh, assassination of uh, Julius Caesar uh, into the Roman Empire, a polite term for what was in fact a military dictatorship. Uh, and that uh, we're uh, toying with that, I'm sorry to say today, very seriously. The uh, imperialism in the sense in which I'm using it, meaning American hegemony over the rest of the world through uh, a uh, empire of bases, a, uh, a military hegemony, not to say that this uh, uh, hegemony by military bases is totally unknown. At the height of the Roman Empire, from uh, Britannia to Armenia, uh, the Romans had approximately 35 major military bases all over this area to dominate it. At the height of uh, the British Empire in, say, uh, uh, 1898, uh, the Victorian uh, military had about 40 naval bases around the world that were used to dominate the world. Today, according to the base structure report, which is an annual inventory of real property owned by the Pentagon, uh, among the very largest bases, uh, Ramstein Air Base in Germany, uh, Cadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, Aviano Base in Italy, uh, places of this sort, Diego Garcia uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have about 40 of these bases that are wor worth well over a billion and a half dollars in, uh, in replacement value. It uh, begins to look like if you want to dominate the world, if you are uh, got uh, Dr. No-like dreams of uh, dominance, you need about 40 military bases. They're unimaginably expensive. Uh, they, uh, uh, they create ill will daily. Uh, they are a democratic disaster, but uh, that's what they do. Now, where did this start for Americans? Without question, an unintended consequence of World War II. That uh, until World War II, certainly we had had a history of imperialism. We did not, as Eisenhower said to us at the end of his term when he invented the phrase military industrial complex, we had not had a huge munitions industry backing it up. Uh, it was, uh, these were standing armies, but still, uh, in case of uh, major military problems, we resorted back to the things we had learned from the Romans, namely the obligation of citizenship to defend the country, the mobilization of people, the time of a national emergency, demobilizing them as soon as the, uh, the uh, emergency was over. I raise this again because it reminds us of things we've forgotten. Perhaps the greatest single warning ever given to our country was in the first presidential farewell address, namely by George Washington, in which he warned the country against the danger of standing armies, that standing armies will destroy the uh, balance of power on which 
the, uh, uh, the structure of our government rests, the separation between executive, legislative, and uh, judicial co-equal branches, by concentrating power in the executive, uh, by uh, destroying federalism, bringing power to Washington, D.C., creating uh, funds in order to maintain standing armies. This is incidentally exactly the thing that destroyed the Roman Republic, was the, uh, the old Roman legions raised from uh, farmers in times of national emergency gave way to long service armies, uh, 20 years duty, then the obligation to take care of them after they were redundant, to uh, find them farms and, and things of this sort. Uh, which uh, did ultimately destroy the, uh, the Roman Republic. The one example just on this subject that I use in Nemesis, uh, where it's gone the other way, uh, is the British Empire after World War II. It's not the best possible example, but the British did realize in 1945 that they could not continue to rule the jewel in the crown, namely India, uh, through their traditional means, administrative massacres, Having just defeated the Nazis, they could not continue to behave like Nazis uh, to the uh, people of South Asia. They therefore made the decision, a decision I certainly recommend to my fellow Americans today, to uh, give up the empire uh, because if there's any one thing that doesn't mix, it's uh, foreign imperialism and domestic democracy. You can't have them both. You could be a domestic democracy and your empire will fall apart. If you want to keep your empire, you're going to lose your domestic democracy. You're going to turn into a tyranny. Uh, that's what happened to Rome. It's what happened to uh, most empires in the past. Uh, the British uh, gave up their empire, uh, as I say, not brilliantly, uh, not with uh, much good grace, uh, but they did so, and uh, they remain a democracy today. The, and it's one of the, uh, their uh, admirable achievements. They also had the convenience of giving up their empire by giving it up to uh, what they call their cousins across the Atlantic. Uh, and that's really where this begins, is that with the end of World War II, the United States finds itself uh, with huge military enclaves in Germany, in Italy, in Japan, with the end of the Korean War in Korea, well over 102 American bases in South Korea after 1953, uh, and that it Keep, it hangs on to these places. It behaves exactly the way the Soviets did in areas that they had uh, conquered, uh, that regardless of the opinions of the people who lived there, they kept them. Then the Americans, of course, would claim we were invited to stay, we were invited in. Imperialists always do that. There's a uh, cottage industry in Britain of writing books about how happy members of the British Empire were. They enjoyed life under the British, all the rest of it. Uh, such books are never written by uh, Indians, Australians, Fiji Islanders, uh, things of this sort. That is, the people on the receiving end simply never see it that way. One must stress, imperialism is a pure form of tyranny. It never, ever rules through consent. Uh, it rules through military force. It would be hard to find a better example than the Americans in, uh, in Iraq today. But it seems to me that's how it begins that we, uh, under the doctrine of containment, uh, the attempt to meet uh, every Soviet success in creating satellites or allies or the uh, continuation of Bolshevik-type revolutions in uh, China and uh, Vietnam, uh, we become immensely alarmed that we are being isolated in the world, that the Soviet Union is an out-of-control military menace, uh, we never, ever get it right. We never understand, really, what a fragile place the Soviet Union was. Uh, and this, over time, starts to create the military-industrial complex. That is, the huge vested interest now in militarism, in the military as a way of life, above all, the military as a way of making a living, the military as a jobs program. In Nemesis, I spend a fair amount of time on the concept military Keynesianism meaning the use of the military budget essentially to provide jobs and work. We see it in America today that uh, uh, it's perfectly logical for the Secretary of Defense to want to close facilities that nobody wants or needs anymore, sometimes as old as the Civil War. Just let him try it. 
the communities affected will go crazy. Every liberal professor, every preacher, every uh, uh, peacenik kid will be out demonstrating, save our base, save our jobs. The, uh, uh, an example I'd like to use, the, uh, the two senators from the state of Washington are two very pleasant, very smart, democratic women, well-educated, serious senators. All you have to do is to say Boeing to them, and before your very eyes, they will turn into bloodlusting fascist hyenas, doing everything in their power to keep uh, Boeing in business. But this has led over time, as Eisenhower warned us in his famous farewell address of 1961, in which he became so appalled by what he had presided over, uh, the creation of the military-industrial complex uh, and of our growing dependence on it, uh, that uh, we didn't pay attention to his warning. It's now close to out of control. It is to me impossible to imagine that any president of either party could truly bring under control the vested interests in the military industrial complex or those embedded in uh, the secret intelligence agencies, particularly the central intelligence agency, uh, that are simply neither of these uh, uh, institutions in our society today are in, under any form of democratic oversight or control. They are uh, uh, the private property of the president as if he were a Roman emperor addressing his Praetorian guards. That's, I think, how it started, where it has ended up today, and that I'm uh, myself convinced as a political scientist it's too late, probably, to do anything about it. And still, it would be the only possible thing one can imagine to do about it is to try and mobilize the citizenry to understand what has happened and to realize that uh, the political system is not going to change, it's not going to protect us. The Democratic Party is no more interested in restoring checks and balances over the presidency than the Republican Party. They simply want to bring, use the checks and balances to, or the, the, the power of the presidency to serve their interests. One of the complex issues in the analysis of American imperialism is the attempt always to reduce it to something else, and particularly to economic interests, corporate interests, seemingly uh, un, uh, illegitimate power in our society, the power of money. It has the smell of a sort of uh, ersatz or vulgar Marxism about it, but it's uh, in the minds of many people an easy, satisfactory explanation that this is really corporate greed that uh, accounts for all of this. I, uh, I just like this view because I think it denigrates what imperialism actually is. That imperialism, the, the, the impulse toward hegemony over other nations, the, uh, the attempt to dominate the rest of the world uh, in which one form of domination is the use of economic power under your control. But uh, you should bear in mind that when one looks at the United States today, it loves to keep talking about how it is the lone superpower and this, that, and the other thing. I guarantee you a superpower that's losing its manufacturing basis as rapidly as this country is, uh, that is the world's largest net debtor nation by orders of magnitude, that is dependent upon uh, the goodwill of bankers in China and Japan in order to continue to enjoy its uh, lifestyle, there are serious anomalies in this kind of explanation. Though there is no question that over the years the, uh, the government has used its imperial apparatus for, uh, for economic purposes, uh, for the advantage of American uh, firms. Perhaps the best examples are the United Fruit Company in Central America, and uh, that is, after the overthrow of the uh, government of, of Guatemala in 1954 by brutal, very brutal means against a small and defenseless country, over the years leading to civil war, police repression, uh, at least 200,000 uh, Guatemalan civilians have lost their lives. All of this was done because the, uh, the uh, United Fruit Company objected to some rather modest proposals for uh, land reform. You could carry it on to uh, the CIA's intervention against uh, 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 
uh, uh, the uh, the president uh, of uh, of uh, Chile, uh, um, uh, Allende, uh, in order to bring to power probably the most odious military dictator in the in the uh, uh, Cold War period, uh, namely uh, uh, General Pinochet. Uh, here, the interests were primarily of uh, IT and T company. They participated closely. That is International Telephone and Telegraph. Uh, participated closely with the CIA in financing and funding and plotting the coup against uh, Salvador Allende. Uh, the, uh, uh, also equally in, uh, in uh, Chile, the mining interests uh, of, of the big uh, copper firms, uh, one of the things that American uh, uh, imperial power has long been used in Latin America in order to protect the interest of extractive industries uh, in uh, in very poor countries such as uh, Bolivia, places of that sort. So there are numerous examples. Perhaps the best single example is the influence of petroleum uh, on governmental policy making. That uh, after all, this also goes back to, uh, to the Iranian case. The Anglo-Iranian oil company, which is today British Petroleum, uh, was uh, very much a British government cartel uh, that was directly connected to the Royal Navy because it supplied fuel for, uh, for British battleships and, uh, and things of this sort. Our, uh, we have had a, uh, a, a very deep interest in this since the 1930s when uh, the Standard Oil Company of California discovered oil in the eastern provinces of, uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia and we uh, began to create uh, a, uh, as friendly a relationship with Saudi Arabia as we possibly could, leading to the creation of the Arabian American Oil Company. The, uh, uh, the very um, uh, uh, foundations, the pillars of our policy in, in the Middle East for much of the post-war world were the relationship with Saudi Arabia created back in the late 1930s uh, and the relationship with uh, uh, Iran created as a result of the coup of 1953 and the bringing to power in that country our puppet, the Shah of, of uh, Iran and his extremely repressive police state uh, organized around the police apparatus called uh, Savak. When that was overthrown in 1979 in an important revolution against us uh, and for which we were totally unprepared, we lost one of our pillars and clearly uh, we are not likely to ever have friendly relations with Iran again as, as far as one can see ahead. In the case of Saudi Arabia, we lost that after the first Gulf War, when stupidly, thoughtlessly, a typical, I'm sorry to say, of the George H.W. Bush administration, that after expelling Saddam Hussein from uh, Kuwait, we uh, uh, put uh, American ground forces in Saudi Arabia, allegedly to defend the House of Fahd, that is the ruling house of Saudi Arabia. Many pious young Saudis, not least of which was the pious young millionaire Osama bin Laden, objected to the use of infidel troops to defend the regime that is charged with defending the two most sacred sites in Islam, Mecca and Medina. Uh, they claimed that we could defend ourselves against uh, Saddam Hussein. It was a stupid thing to do, to even imagine putting our often racially biased, arrogant, and remarkably stupid troops into a country like Saudi Arabia where they wouldn't possibly have understood what they were getting into or the cultural norms that they were trampling on uh, almost uh, daily uh, being there. It was also unnecessary even from a military point of view. Saudi Arabia is surrounded by water. We have 12 carrier task forces. They're among the most expensive military apparatuses on earth. Uh, Saudi Arabia was always easily protected from at sea on our own ships rather than putting troops in Saudi Arabia. The fact that we did put troops there uh, in part maddened Osama bin Laden as we know in some detail, uh, but it uh, caused the Soviets, uh, the uh, Saudis, I beg your pardon, <laughs> the, Saudi, the Saudis to become less and less interested in their alliance with us uh, they progressively restricted our use of the huge military base at Riyadh, uh, Prince Sultan uh, Air Base, so that by the time of the assault on uh, Iraq in 2003, 
uh, our use of uh, Prince Sultan had stopped. We moved our forces to uh, Qatar, uh, and, uh, and in fact this is one of the main motivations for the attack on Iraq, was to find a new central territory that would replace Iran and Saudi Arabia as our previous main bases of operation in, uh, uh, in the Middle East. Not of least importance was the fact that, uh, that uh, Iraq is an oil-rich country, but it wasn't that primarily. The oil was probably of greater interest to us as a means of leverage over other countries such as China uh, and others, uh, Japan, that are dependent upon uh, imported petroleum uh, from this part of the world. Saudi Arabia is the largest single exporter of, uh, of oil. The, uh, so that it's, um, uh, it, as one looks back on it, uh, uh, petroleum has dominated our, uh, our policies in many ways. Uh, as a former consultant to the Office of National Estimates of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, I have to say that the only representative of the private sector ever on the Board of National Estimates was uh, uh, a retired official of the Arabian American Oil Company. Uh, he was there for a perfectly good reason. Uh, this was of great interest to the agency in, uh, in writing uh, national intelligence estimates. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I would like to stress, yes, we have very often, and rather unscrupulously, often rather thoughtlessly, uh, uh, used American military power to serve the interests, quite parochial interests, of American uh, businesses, of American investors, uh, of the American balance of payments. We have kidded ourselves repeatedly that we are interested in free trade, that uh, we believe globalization is an ineluctable process of technological innovation, uh, that uh, we are as much controlled by it as we control it, that you can just almost hear Bill Clinton saying, the market made me do it, uh, when uh, the, uh, this is, of course, utter nonsense. Any time that any of these forces have stood in the way of our interests, as, for example, they do today over issues of subsidization of American agriculture, we simply ignore these international rules and, uh, and uh, put them aside. Uh, empires are starting to fall with the, uh, the speed of FedEx these days. I mean, the Romans lasted for a long time because communications were so bad it took a couple of years to get out to the edge of the, uh, of the empire to even find out that somebody had lost a battle. Uh, but uh, in my lifetime, I was born in 1931, uh, I've seen the collapse of the uh, of the Imperial Japanese, of the uh, Nazi, uh, of the Italian uh, empires of the German, French, Dutch, uh, Portuguese empires, the Soviet empire. Uh, this is quite a few. And if you just extended it on to, uh, to the 20th century, well, you would get the Chinese empire, the Ottoman empire, things of this sort. There is something intrinsically unstable about it uh, that you're risking uh, a, a very severe collapse. Moreover, uh, military Keynesianism, the military-industrial complex, the devotion of massive resources to the military has unintended consequences that we refuse to, uh, to acknowledge. That we are now spending close to a trillion dollars a year, that's a thousand billion, on our military establishment. This is not the defense appropriation that is published. That's, that's simply the annual appropriation of the Department of Defense. It doesn't include the money spent on nuclear weapons, that's in the Department of Energy. It doesn't include the money spent on uh, Veterans Affairs, that's in the Department of Veterans Affairs, including treating our uh, uh, wounded from Iraq. It uh, doesn't include uh, foreign military aid, that's in the State Department. It doesn't include the actual defense of the country, that's the Department of Homeland Security. Since after 9-11 we discovered the Department of Defense has nothing to do with defense of the country. It's, uh, it's busying itself with warfare in outer space or some other uh, lucrative, if useless, way to spend money. Uh, it all adds up to an unbelievable amount that is, um, over time, not sustainable. It reminds us of a 
famous remark by um, Herbert Stein when he was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in, uh, in Richard Nixon's administration. He rather famously said, things that can't go on forever don't. Uh, these things can't go on forever, and they're not going to. That is, the American empire could come to an end before this film is over if just one little thing happened. If Saudi Arabia decided that it wanted to be paid for its oil in euros instead of dollars. Uh, the agreement with the Saudi Arabians goes back to World War II when they agreed that oil transactions would be priced in do dollars. There's no reason to do that anymore. The euro is a much more valuable currency. As an author, I am delighted to have royalties paid in euros. They're, they're more valuable than dollars. Uh, and that uh, if the Saudi Arabians simply did that before the evening was over, uh, the American stock exchange would collapse, uh, the uh, backing for the dollar would end, and the dollar would become uh, as useless as it should be in f old fashioned formal economic theory for a country with the world's largest uh, trade deficits uh, year in, year out. Uh, and uh, we would be uh, in the same fix as. Uh, Germany in 1923, China in 1948, Argentina in 2001 and 2, just a couple of years ago. It's, uh, bankruptcy is not funny. It's better than an atomic explosion. But uh, you'll recall that German bankruptcy led at once to the rise of the Nazi Party. Uh, Chinese bankruptcy led to the victory of the Chinese Communist Party the following year. Uh, the, uh, it would unleash in this country uh, almost unimaginable pressures, often for revolution, uh, once you wipe out the wealth of uh, all of the, the society. And we're toying with that. We're threatening that with our uh, uh, fiscal imbalances, with uh, George Bush's uh, refusal to tax the wealthy, uh, and, uh, and with these expenditures that don't go anywhere. Uh, military Keynesians say, once you start creating jobs through the military. It's not Keynesianism anymore. Keynes never used the phrase himself anyway. But Keynes spoke of counter-cyclical spending. That is, in depressed times, using public monies to provide work for people who didn't have a means of, of sustenance. But that when full employment returned, then you taxed them and began to retire the debt. I guarantee you that you never go back on military spending. You never start cutting it off. It, uh, I offer you again another anecdote. We're uh, sitting here talking in the 50th district of California. This is the home of recently uh, Congressman Randy Duke Cunningham, the Republican, who is now spending eight and a half years in federal prison for uh, accepting bribes, openly advertised for, uh, from defense contractors, uh, a uh, particularly cynical way of doing it. The thing that interests me about this case, though, is that well before the uh, federal prosecutor in San Diego had gotten on to, to uh, Cunningham and was preparing a case against him, I had written an op-ed in the LA Times pointing out that just from his submissions to the Federal Election Commission that he was bought and paid for by the military industrial complex. That his biggest sources of funds were uh, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, uh, and, and as well as these small countries like companies like MZM. The thing that interested me is that I got quite a few letters from or districts like the 34th district in California, in downtown Los Angeles, uh, of people saying, God, I wish Cunningham were my congressman. I could use a good job. I don't mind making uh, uh, cluster bobs and using them to drop on uh, innocent Lebanese children. That's what we do in America. Uh, we don't make much anything anymore, but uh, we do make weapons and munitions, and they're good, and they're really lethal. Uh, and uh, that's what I need, is to get in on it, that the uh, uh, the two mother hens of the Defense Facilities Subcommittee of the Senate Armed Services Committee are Kay Bailey Hutchinson of Texas and Diane Feinstein of California. These are the two states with the largest number of military bases, and these two senators will do anything in their power to keep those bases open and functioning. They mean uh, jobs for their constituents. I mention this simply to say how deeply military Keynesianism has penetrated our society and started to erode our democratic bases. That is, the uh, compromises that we are now prepared to make in order to keep our head above water. I 
to answer the question directly, why should we be concerned about imperialism and militarism? It's a suicide pact. That's the way empires end. The uh, uh, presidency has taken on imperial pretensions, that it is now claiming Caesarian influence. The, uh, it is to be obeyed uh, as if it were a, uh, uh, a uh, unchallenged source of political authority uh, and that it uh, is to be trusted with the most critical things in our society. Uh, this is absurd. It is as contrary to American constitutional theory and practice as one can imagine. The president goes around saying, I am the decider. It's hard to think of anything that more outrages the, uh, the very foundations of the American Constitution, which are that we do not have a decider, that in fact political leadership consists in the ability to come to compromises among three separate and co-equal branches of government, and if you can't make a compromise, then your views do not prevail. This was, as uh, numerous Supreme Court justices have said over the years, this was never intended to make for a more efficient government. It was intended as a bulwark against tyranny, against dictatorship, against the seizure of unwarranted power. This has come about in the United States as a result of our wars. Uh, that is, the, uh, the two characteristic uh, branches. There are others that you could go into, but the two characteristic departments of the imperial presidency are certainly the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence Agency two organizations on the south bank of the Potomac River that uh, the founders of our government simply would have found unimaginable. Uh, that uh, the, uh, the Constitution guarantees in Article I, I can't remember the exact clause, that uh, citizens of the United States will receive ultimately an accurate accounting of how tax dollars were spent. This is not a George Bush thing. That's not been true in America since the Manhattan Project to build atom bombs during World War II. The Americans do not get anything like an accurate statement of how their tax dollars are spent. The budgets of the all 16 federal intelligence agencies, particularly and notably the CIA, have been secret from the day they were created. That has turned these agencies into a private army of the presidents. He's the only person that can check them, the only one who can give them orders, uh, and that uh, there is no, uh, uh, no oversight for what he does. In the case of the Department of Defense, 40% of the monstrous defense budget is black. It is secret. It can be seen only by uniformed military officers and a couple of deeply hamstrung members of Congress who cannot report on anything that the military sees fit to tell them or discuss it with anybody else or to put it in a bill or anything of that sort. It is secret allegedly because these are classified projects uh, uh, being paid for, but as we know, many of them come through uh, uh, unscrutinized uh, 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 additions to, uh, uh, to the budget uh, that are fed in by corrupt congressmen. Uh, uh, congressman uh, uh, Cunningham was a good example, so-called earmarks uh, that are attached for all sorts of spurious purposes that uh, serve the interests of uh, of the private sector. It's uh, out of control. You, uh, there is no effective oversight of uh, the presidency. One of the things that, uh, I mean, the CIA had no oversight of any sort until <coughs> the uh, mid-1970s when the Church Committee was appointed because of the uh, misuse of the intelligence agencies by Nixon in Watergate. And they created the original uh, congressional uh, oversight committees. These have been farcical. They do nothing. When uh, uh, Congressman Charlie Wilson of uh, Texas in, uh, became the uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Oversight Committee, uh, he rather famously called his friends at the CIA and said, the, uh, uh, the uh, fox is in the hen house. You can do anything you want to. Uh, that was oversight. That's basically what it is. The current President's Intelligence Oversight Board uh, a, a check on misuse and illegal activities in the intelligence agencies that has worked through the past five presidencies. It was created by, uh, by uh, Jerry Ford. 
uh, has not actually met, done anything, requested any information or anything for the first five and a half years of the George Bush administration. It has uh, simply uh, made itself notorious now for having defied a presidential order. The Presidential uh, Intelligence Oversight Board was made permanent by Ronald Reagan in 1981. These are the kinds of things that are out of control. Then you add into them uh, the President's misuse of, um, of uh, legal advice to give him still further powers that are contrary to virtually everything that we have ever thought of. That is, the, uh, the so-called signing statements. A law passed by Congress becomes a law when the President signs it. Uh, the, uh, the President is prohibited from a line item veto. He either signs it or he vetoes it, and then it goes to Congress to decide what to do about it. The pres this President has misused something that is fairly old in our democracy, but that never have we seen its use today, so-called signing statements, uh, in which the President, in signing a, um, uh, a law, signing a, a, a law that's been enacted by Congress, assigns it, adds to it a bill or a letter of his saying, I don't agree with this or that stipulation, this amounts to a line item veto, and I'm not going to enforce it. It will simply not be implemented uh, so long as I'm president. Uh, this is clearly uh, unconstitutional uh, assertion of uh, executive authority that uh, uh, ought not stand, but uh, uh, it has not been challenged. The president has uh, uh, worked assiduously to stack the courts with uh, rather thoughtless flunkies uh, that will do his bidding, that will accept his particular theory that <clears throat> national security is uh, beyond the purview of, uh, of uh, congressional oversight, etc., things of this sort. In some ways, the hardest thing to explain about this, and I've just offered a few examples, there are numerous examples of the vast expansion of, uh, of, ex of uh, executive authority the, uh, you had the President's legal counsel, today the Attorney General of the United States, declaring that uh, the Geneva Conventions on the Treatment of Prisoners of War and Civilians in Wartime were obsolete and that he no longer intended to enforce them. The Constitution is unequivocal on that subject. We sponsored, we wrote, we ratified the Geneva Treaties. The Constitution says that a ratified treaty is the, not just the law of the land, it is the supreme law of the land. No Secretary of Defense, no Attorney General, nobody has the right to tamper with that. It could only be done by an act of Congress. That would, uh, uh, the, uh, what is hard to explain is why Congress has so abdicated its role, why it has uh, been so easily and perversely bought off, paid for, uh, uh, compromised, working for the military-industrial complex rather than to observe it and to take heed of uh, <clears throat> the warnings of uh, famous generals as presidents from Washington to, uh, to Eisenhower. Uh, the, uh, there are many reasons for it. They're complex. One could go into them, but that it's, um, they are backed up, of course, by a seemingly somnolent public, too, a public that is no longer playing uh, what Benjamin Franklin imagined to be the citizen role, that is, of elementary oversight of one's government. To the extent that there are citizens who are the least bit interested in keeping watch on what their government does, I have to say to them, I'm sorry, it's impossible. You can't get the information. The press has failed you as thoroughly as any institution possibly could have. Uh, if you are an extremely adept user of the Internet, you can become better informed than somebody who reads one of the lowbrow daily newspapers uh, of America with uh, uh, foreign correspondents located in essentially Disneyland. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, but uh, it's not going to tell you uh, about, say, the size of the defense budget or uh, who's profiting from the government, the way the government is set up, who has begun to understand that given the secrecy of the CIA, CIA officials can simply be ripping off the place, just robbing it right and left, and you wouldn't know it. 
the uh, number three CIA official, Kyle Dusty Fogo, uh, the former uh, uh, chief administrative officer and uh, chief supply officer of the CIA, is under indictment in San Diego for uh, funneling contracts to friends of his and in return being uh, lavishly uh, treated to uh, trips around the world, uh, golfing vacations, and promised a job when he retired from the CIA. We don't know how much of that goes on. It's very hard to f even begin to find out. Uh, so that it's, uh, we would like to see a renaissance of public information, uh, public awareness, public a attempts to hold their representatives responsible, but uh, there seems to be a sense of powerlessness in the society, I find today, uh, of a, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, this is the third book I've written on these problems of misused presidential power and the threat to our democracy. Uh, I've had a probably more favorable reaction in the third one, in, in Nemesis, than to either of the other two, uh, which um, I, I would like to think that, of course, it's because it's a better book, but I'm not sure it is. I think the public is scared to death. They actually know we're in terrible trouble. We're heading toward, over a cliff, and they don't know what to do about it. 